thank you very much, guys. It's, uh, I don't know if I'm con in control of this now or not. <laughs> oh, here we go. So it's very good to be here. It is really good to be here. You don't know how good it is to be here, and I'll explain what I mean by that as we, as we go along. So uh, I'm going to start with a question, because somebody told me that that's what you should do to get the audience engagement. So I don't know if you guys can remember where you were six weeks ago. It's not so long ago, right? Like 10th of April. Uh, maybe it's the end of the Easter weekend. In the UK, we take the whole week off for Easter, as you know, because we, we, we take it, we take it easy. So if you can imagine where you were ten, uh, six weeks ago, this is where I was. So I was dismasted and adrift, deep in the South Atlantic. I was alone and I was in trouble, basically. Um, so I'd like to tell you a quick story about how I ended up there and really how I got back to be here talking to you exactly six weeks ago, six weeks later. So. Now, to do that, I'm, I need to uh, give you, start with a little bit of a history lesson. I know I won't be preachy or teachy or anything today, but just to give you some context, because what I was taking part in is uh, something called the Golden Globe Race. And that's got its heritage that, run, that goes back to 1969. So 1969, this gentleman, Sir Robin Knox Johnson, was the first person to sail around the world solo and nonstop. Never been done before. He took 312 days alone at sea to achieve that. And he came back the winner of what was the Sunday Times Golden Globe race at the time. Now, six, 1969, most people will recognize this image, was also the time that we put the first person or people on the moon. Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, Apollo 11 mission, eight days in space, first, first man on the moon. Since 1969, fun fact, we've put twice as many people into space then have managed to sail around the world non-stop and solo. In fact, far more than twice. And we've just added four more this week, right? Four more have just gone up this week. And that makes this sailing event still one of the great sort of human challenges, human adventures. There's a reason why less than 300 people have managed to do this before. Uh, and people often call it the Everest of sailing, and we mix up our metaphors nicely, right? Get a bit of climbing, a bit of space travel in there. But uh, it gives you a feeling for what, it, what it's all about. And this was a challenge that has fascinated me, well, all of my sailing career for many, many years now. And it was a challenge that I wanted to find a way to uh, someday uh, achieve. Now, luckily for me, a gentleman called Don McIntyre, who's an Australian adventurer and sailor and a crazy guy, decided that uh, the Golden Globe race needed to be reimagined for the 21st century and brought back. He decided that the world needed an event that wasn't based on big budgets and carbon race boats because that was too exclusive. He decided that there was an event out there for the adventurer, an event that anyone with the right experience could, could take part in. And he sort of reimagined the Golden Globe race. And this race would start in France, it would have competitors sail 30,000 miles around the world via the three great capes, including Cape Horn at the bottom of the world and back up to France. The race would be non-stop and uh, skippers would be totally off-grid and self-sufficient for up to anything up to 300 days at sea. So sailing around the world, non-stop, up to 300 days alone. And just to make it a little bit more difficult, if that wasn't hard enough, the skippers could only use technology that was around in 1969, so basically no modern tech. What that means is no GPS, no digital maps. So the sun and the stars and the sextant, paper charts, why not, I mean it, <laughs> why not watch to sail around the world, to navigate your way around the world. There'd be no weather routing software on board, no, no smartphones, there's no app for this race. Sailing like it's 1969. It would be the world's longest and loneliest race. So I thought, great idea, I'll sign up for that, I'll do that. <laughs> That's exactly what I've been waiting for. This is my opportunity. So uh, in 2019, I signed up to take part in this race and started to, uh, started to prepare myself. Who am I? Who am I? Well, I was born in 1969. You do the maths, if you like. <laughs> I think it's 54. <laughs> uh, I don't think that's relevant, though. Uh, first thing to know is I'm not a professional sailor at all. 
Uh, I don't come from a sailing background or a sailing family. I'm not a pro athlete. In fact, I spent 20 years in the software industry. Uh, in my past, I've been the CEO of a startup company here in Chicago. Uh, so I've had a normal sort of corporate career, if you like, always in commercial roles, which means I'm not bright enough to be a developer. So you know. I've sat in some of the sessions this uh, last two days and I haven't understood a word of it, but that's never stopped me before. <laughs> so uh, very normal guy at home. I'm married to Sally. I've got three grown up kids. I've got all the commitments that everybody else has got. But what I did have was I, had, I really had a dream and I had a rather bloody-minded determination to try and make that dream a reality. Oh, I should say, I also done a bit of sailing. I forgot to, forgot to mention that. So I'm not a complete idiot. <laughs> I've got probably 25 years of sailing experience so, um, and a lot of miles under my belt. I had previously circumnavigated before this, but I had done that on a big boat with a crew and then we've stopped. And what I was going to try and do now, of course, was sail without stalls on a small boat by myself. So, you know, the yin and the yang of it. So I've been sailing for, for a fair amount of time. Uh, but as I say, not, not a professional sailor at all. So I signed up for the race. I was born in 1969, so that's good. I've done a bit of sailing. So now I need a boat. And this is my beautiful boat, Puffin, my friend. So Puffin is, uh, she's a trade wind 35 for the sailors in the room, uh, an old boat from the 1970s, which is part of the ethos of this race. You couldn't bring new carbon or new race boats into it. Uh, she's 35 foot long, she's 10 foot wide, five feet of draft. She's a, what is she? She's a, she's a cutter rig. And, and of course, she's a long keel, she's a long keel boat. And of course, as Captain Jeff Sparrow once said, they're all the things that a boat needs. What a boat is, is freedom. She was my, my freedom. She was my spacecraft, right? She was going to be my life support system. If you think about it, she is everything to me. On the boat, I'm safe. Off the boat, quite frankly, I'm dead. While in Puffin back in 2019, I signed up for the race in 2019, I bought the boat. She was also my first statement from the tent. So it was a way of announcing to the world what my, my plans were. Uh, and it was important because by doing that, I committed myself. I sort of stepped over uh, a, a line. So she was, she was the beginning of making a dream real. So that's Puffin. So I had a boat and I needed a team. Oh, that's a close-up, isn't it? I didn't realize that was going to look so big. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So uh, I needed a team. I like to say it's a solo race, but you can't do it by yourself. The GGR is not an event that you can just enter and go. It doesn't work like that. It needs years of very careful preparation and planning and a perfect execution if you're going to take a small boat solo around the world because the risks are, are, are so, so high. Uh, so I was going to need a team to help me get there. They say that the, the race to the start line is the first race of the race. And in fact, 32 skippers, well-qualified people signed up for this race and only 16 got to the start line. So the attrition is extremely high in this event. Luckily for me, my team came, came and found me. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's back to this statement of intent. Once I'd committed to the race and I kind of stepped over that Rubicon, the world, the universe sort of came calling and uh, people started to find me. So old friends came out of the woodwork, friends of friends, came out of the wood, were complete strangers stepped forward uh, to help. And before I knew it, I was forming a team. And uh, what, what really struck me during this time was that, you know, these, um, that if you put yourself out there, the idea that folks will come and find you almost and uh, sort of help you, help you through, through this period. And what happened was people came forward and they brought hard skills, you know, they brought technical skills. Some people just provided labor. Other friends came forward with sponsorship to help me buy uh, equipment and uh, supplies for the trip. Basically, it became bigger than just me. And these folks that sort of joined me and became this sort of HJ sailing team, it became their adventure too. Uh, and uh, that in itself was an amazing experience. To start a project, to put yourself out there, it's a personal mission, and then to find you're sharing that with a much, a much you know, not, not just an audience, but uh, many more people. So I had a team, 
And fast forward, fast forward, <laughs> move quicker. <laughs> fast forward three and a half years, and I'm in France, Le Sable de Lone in France, at, at the race village. Amazing experience. I call this my 15 minutes of fame. Tens of thousands of people turned up to, uh, turned up to the race village. It was open for two weeks, and people wanted to see the boats and meet the skippers. Uh, the interest in the sailing race was, was, was interesting in that it wasn't just sailors. It wasn't people that were just into boats. People seemed to identify with the adventure and the fact that these people were going to set off alone you know, and, and, try, and try and try and achieve this, this thing by sailing around the world. And uh, as I say, I called it my 15 minutes of fame because it was the first time in my life that I've signing autographs became normal. It was, it was a very, very surreal experience. So I'd be working on the boat, I'd be on the pontoon. In the bars and the restaurants of Saab de Lone, kids would come up with their uh, posters and their, uh, what would you call them, programs. Uh, and, I'd, and I'd be signing autographs. And I got quite, quite you know, it was quite blasé about signing everybody's autographs. Old ladies would come up on the pontoon and give me a hug and a kiss and got a tear in their eye and uh, wish me a bon voyage. It was an amazing experience. Uh, wonderful and overwhelming. But again, a bit like when the team formed, it kind of said, oh, this is it's bigger than just me. I, I just wanted to go sailing around the world. I didn't know that the world was going to get behind this. And, and they did. You know, people were going to follow. So... Day zero, 4th of September comes along and uh, it's time to go. It's finally time to, uh, to start and slip lines. And it was uh, oh, it's really hard, really hard. I thought I was a tough, roughy sort of sailor guy and I'd just say goodbye to everyone and step all oh, my life. The, the build-up was so much and so intense. It's really hard to let those lines slip. But we did pull the way, last hugs and kisses, last waves. And we paraded down the, uh, out of the harbour. And La Sable de Lone's got a very famous, they call it the canal. It's basically two harbour walls. And there was literally tens of thousands of people there that day. And remember, we're amateur sailors. Everyone taking part in this race is just normal Joes. And we parade down, down the canal uh, and out into, into the bay there. And the music's playing and the compares are talking. It's just something else. Very, very sort of emotional time. There's dozens of boats on the water. It's chaos, to be quite frank. Like every sailing race, you get your five, you get your 10-minute gun, you get your four-minute gun, you get your one-minute gun, bang, and the, the star gun goes off. We crossed the line, and 16 boats started that day, and we sailed into the Bay of Biscay onto the on the first leg of the trip. And that first stage, uh, let me do this, that first stage uh, was going to take us from the Bay of Biscay to the Canary Islands, to, to Lanzarote, uh, to something that we call a film gate. I see, that's not, that's not, that's quite a small distance to start with. That was only two weeks. And I've got to explain this, film gates, very quickly. So the first, it wasn't a stop. The first thing we had to do was get to Lanzarote uh, uh, for what we call a film gate. Now, back in 1969, when the skippers wanted to send their letters home or drop their films off, they would sail in towards a harbour, meet another boat, pass over their letters and their films in the hope that that would then be forwarded, forwarded on to go home. It's been done for centuries by sailors. So the GGR recreated that. We were uh, compelled to sail into certain film gates, meet a GGR rib, and we would drop off our letters and our SD cards, and we'd talk to the, get interviewed by the GGR team. And that was like, going to be our only human contact for whatever, up to eight or nine months at sea. And the first one of those was, was Lanzarote in the Canary Islands. Now, really, that stage one was a shakedown. It was a shakedown for the boat, technically, and for me, emotionally. Uh, we went straight into the Bay of Biscay and hit a gale straight away. Anybody that knows about the Bay of Biscay, it's infamous for its, for its weather. And that was a good shakedown for the boat, and it was obviously a good shakedown for me, so tick on that. But it was the beginning of a real roller coaster of emotions. The whole event was like this. So it was a big high to leave us hard alone after three and a half years and having all those people waving you off. And then you've got this big low that you've missed your family, right? You left the family behind. And then you think, oh, but I'm, I'm finally away at sea, and that's fantastic. It's, you're a sailor, you're offshore, it's, it's everything you're, you're supposed to be doing. And then all the fears and doubts start kicking in. You think, what the hell am I doing? What the hell was I thinking? Southern Ocean, 30,000 miles, Cape Horn, the Bay of Biscay was bad enough. You know, 200 days alone, what the heck was I thinking? So these sort of fears and doubts all come at the same time. 
but it's all part of the process. 17 days later, I'm coming into Lanzarote thinking, oh, okay, I've done okay, I've had my shakedown. Uh, and I discovered it was a shakedown not just for me, but for the other skippers. And two skippers had already dropped out by then. We're only 17 days in. Uh, one guy, Edward, Canadian, dropped out because his head wasn't ready. And the second guy, uh, called Guy, sorry, <laughs> uh, made a navigational error, probably due to exhaustion. He put his boat on a beach. It was salvaged, it was fine, he was safe, but he was out of the race. We're only 17 days in, so it's shook all the other skippers. You know, this was a bit of a wake-up call for us all. Um, and we realized this is, it, you start to realize this is it's kind of serious. After Lanzarote, the race really begins. And the next part of the journey, I call it stage two, takes us from the Canary Islands to Cape Town. So to do that, we sail across the North Atlantic, we cross the equator in an area called the Doldrums, down through the South Atlantic, around the St. Helena High, and then up to Cape Town. Now, this phase is really almost a holiday of the, of, of the whole journey. This is champagne sailing, or it should be most of the time. Beautiful trade winds push you along day after day, blue skies, blue ocean, wonderful. Dolphins and whales come to see you, you know, the whole thing. Flying fish ahead, it's exactly what it was all about. This is, this is kind of, if you, if you had a picture of, a, of, of the holiday sailing trip around the world, that's the first phase. You do have to pass through the doldrums. That's very frustrating because it's an area of, uh, of no winds or a lack of winds. And then you suddenly discover that actually no wind is far worse than any number of gales, far more frustrating. But once you get over that, it's fine. For me, when I think about it, this was really about getting into, into my rhythm, you know, of being at sea. And uh, particularly being at sea alone. So without stating the obvious, there's no one to give you a hand. <laughs> there, uh, you know, if a job needs to do and only you can do it. If there's a problem, and there was plenty of problems, only you can solve it. I mean, how often do we do anything in our lives that we don't talk to someone else, right? that we can't pull our hand up and ask for something, even if you know the answer? We still ask somebody else, don't we? If I've got to lift something heavy, I'll wait for someone to give me a hand. All of a sudden, you realize you can't do that. And it's quite strange. You have to get over that being alone element. But, you know, the upsides are great. Flying fish, dolphins, whales coming to see you, all that stuff, all, all fantastic. And I was really finding my rhythm on the way into Cape Town. 81 days later, excuse me, 81 days later, I find myself sailing into Table Bay underneath a beautiful table mountain. Uh, of, uh, of, of Cape Town. And it turned out to be quite, quite a big day. So I've just gone into my rhythm. I'm used to being on my own now. I'm sailing in here. I'm going to meet people for the first time for 80 days, but it's only 80 days. And this is the film gate. So I can see the GGR rib powering, powering out to meet me. And I'm busy. I'm putting my sails away. I'm dropping the mainsail. I'm putting my head sail away. And I'm eyeballing this rib. There's six or seven people on the rib. That's normal. It's powering towards me. And there's a blonde guy in the bows. He's kind of hanging on like he's some kind of Navy SEAL. He's passing along. It catches my eye once, catches my eye twice. And the rib's coming up. And I look, it's my son. My son's on the rib. It's my son Owen. You know, the last person that I was expecting to see. And it turns out that the family and the team had dispatched Owen to Cape Town because they're all worried I was going to give up drop out the race. <laughs> and, uh, I wasn't going to give up. I was fine. I was, I was in my rhythm with the, the dolphins and all that stuff going on. It was great. But apparently the rest of the world had decided that Ian was looking a bit shaky and he, and he, and he needed a boost. So Owen had been dispatched, which he was quite cool about that, you know, free trip to Cape Town. And, and his message to me was really simple. He says, you know, don't stop. Just keep doing what you're doing. Ignore your race position, don't worry what's going on in the world, you, you, you've got this. And the reason they thought, not only that I was shaking, but what I didn't realize at the time, was that six other skippers had dropped out. We drop, in the process of dropping out, we're dropping out. So we're down to eight out of 16 now, and we're only into day 81. So, uh, so that was, so, whew, so no pressure. So he turns up, don't drop out. <laughs> So I wasn't going to drop out anyway, but now definitely I couldn't drop out. I couldn't drop out for the family or the team, so fully committed. It's a very smart move. So there's many stages of commitment you have to go to if you want to make a dream happen. And somewhere along the way, somebody's got to come and embarrass you into sticking at it, you know? So Owen came to keep me honest. 30 minutes later, I've dropped my films off, I've dropped my letters off, and they're gone. And I'm alone again. And I'm sailing off into the night at a table bay. 
<laughs> that was, but it was like leaving all over again. It was, it was a very, very strange experience. Highs and lows, right? Highs and lows. It's not in my presentation, uh, Yorn, but somebody once told me, don't have high highs, don't have low lows. You've got to stay right down the middle. Well, I totally screwed that up. I was up and down, <laughs> up and down with every wave. But I am a bit of an emotional guy. Stage three, Cape Town. Leaving Cape Town. Cape Town to, to Hobart. So this, this phase of the race had you leaving Cape Town, going around the Cape of Good Hope. So that's the first great Cape. Dropping down to 40 degrees south, the roaring 40s, as it's known. Across the southern Indian Ocean, past Cape Lewin, second Great Cape, that's the southwest tip of Australia. Over here is Cape Lewin, not the most exciting cape in the world. I didn't see it. Dropping down towards uh, Tasmania and Hobart. Um, a, a heck of a journey in its own right. It's a huge ocean and it's infamous, absolutely infamous ocean for difficult, difficult sailing conditions. Um, and what's really uh, for sailors, roaring, 40 me roaring 40s means something. And what it means is suddenly you've got, everything changes. You cross the 40th parallel south, and the world changes. It's like you flick a switch. So all those blue skies and blue oceans, they're gone. Gray sky, gray sea. Suddenly you've got big winds, big, big weather, big seas, basically, because these storm systems are rolling around the bottom of the planet. Nothing's to stop them, and they build up big seas. And it's, it's just a, it's an awesome place to be, and it's exactly why I wanted to sail around the world. So it was all part of the deal. But, it, but it's a significant ocean. And then coming into Hobart was a, a massive sense of satisfaction because it was 135 days since I left. 135 days, and I've navigated halfway around the world with a wind-up watch, a sextant, and a paper chart. And I could have hit Australia, but I hit the little spot right down there, which is where I was meant to go. This tiny spot in the ocean. And that was massive, massive satisfaction because it kind of proved <laughs> you could do, I could do this, but it could be done. Uh, and it felt really great to be able to pull that off. Emotionally, this stage was all about becoming at one with Puffin and, and the ocean for me. And, it, and if, if I was getting into my groove earlier on, this was more about becoming pelagic. I was becoming a sea creature. This is what I did for a living. Uh, at this stage, I didn't need instruments on the boat. Puffin told me when something needed changing. I didn't set alarm clocks anymore because I felt when something had changed. I knew when the wind had changed. Puffin would wake me up and I'd have to deal with it. I don't know, that sounds weird and spooky, but <laughs> it's a fact. This is kind of how tuned in you get. And, you know, although I was very much alone, by this point, 135 days, I didn't feel lonely anymore. Yes, I was alone, but I was no longer lonely. I was kind of at one in my environment. And it was, uh, it was a great period. Oh, I'm doing okay. <laughs> Stage four of the race, Furious 50s. Um, so we've had the, what are they called, the 40s? Roaring 40s. So we've had the Roaring 40s and we're going to go to the Furious 50s. So this, this, uh, this stage of the race takes us really from Tasmania to Cape Horn. So we drop out of Tasmania, we go south into New Zealand, um, cross the southern Pacific Ocean, which is huge, 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 whole charts with no land masses on, it's just blue. It's a complete waste of money buying the maps for that part of the world. There's nothing, absolutely nothing on them. Complete waste of money. Until you get to kind of here-ish, and then you're in the 40s and then you dive down into the furious 50s, because you've got to get down to 50, 60 degrees south, because when they made the world, they made this pointy bit at the bottom, and you've got to get around the pointy bit at the bottom, which is Cape Horn. And, uh, the Furious, the Furious 50s, there's an old sailor's proverb, and it says, below 40 degrees south, there is no law. Below 50 degrees south, there is no God. And that was from the days of the clipper ships, and that's how the sailors used to think about this part of the world. This was not a place, it's cold, it's wet, it's dangerous, and it's not for tourists. You know, it's not the place to be, unless you know, kind of know what you're doing. So anyway, that was that leg of the journey for Puffin and I, Actually, the approach to uh, Cape Horn had been going quite well. We'd had, we'd had quite a good run. Um, usual gales and calms and all that sort of stuff. But we were doing fine. We were doing just fine. Um, but of course, it can't be that easy. Nobody said it'd be that easy. Situation changed. 
we suddenly got a gale warning as we we're approaching the horn. The gale warning turns into a storm warning, and a storm warning on that turns into yeah, a storm. And on about the 22nd of March, I think it was, we got hit by a particularly nasty storm. And my steering system, there's a self-steering system on these boats. Just remember, I can't steer all the time. There's no electronic auto helms. It's purely mechanical and operated by the wind. Well, the wind bloody blew my system <laughs> to, to bits. So there I am, I'm 60 miles off the horn, and I've got a broken self-steering system. So I've got a problem. This is a bit of a disaster. Uh, it could be the end of my race. So um, 60 miles off the horn, I need to repair this, this, this steering system. And of course, there's not many marinas around there, right? There's nowhere to really pull into. So this is, this is not going to be easy. That night, I put a drogue out in the back of the boat. A drogue's like a big parachute that you throw out of the back. It's like putting a handbrake on, on the sailing boat to let the storm roll over me. And the next day, I was going to try and repair my system. Well, that drogue, unfortunately, got itself wrapped around my steering system and tore it to bits. So I went from having a problem to having a really big problem there. I had to go to port. So I put a phone call in, and this is where the tech comes out. You pull your sat phone in, you call race control, and you say, basically, I'm out. I need to go and stop in a port. They say, yeah, fine. That's great. Off you go. You can talk to your team now and make a plan. And I'm thinking I've got to go to Ushuaia in Argentina or Ulta Williams in, in Chile, somewhere like that. Um, but that's fine. I can make a plan with the team now to repair this thing. But I've got one small detail. I've still got to get around Cape Horn. So I take this rogue in, Cape Horn's 60 miles away, the weather's coming in, and I need to get behind Cape Horn because there's another storm coming. But I've got a hand steer all the way. So what that means, if it's not obvious, is that I'm on my own on the boat. So if I'm steering, I can't be down below, I can't be eating, I can't be doing anything else. And I've got about 36 hours of sailing ahead of me. It's some pretty nasty conditions, minimum 36, 48 hours to get around Cape Horn. But you know, it's got to be. It's got to be done. It's got to be done. Excuse me. So I was kind of there, and I was broken, and I needed to get. Oh no! Uh, and I needed to get there. So guys, down here, this is Cape Horn, and these are the islands. That's the Beagle Channel up 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 here. So that night, or that day, I'm sailing hand steering all the way into the night and through the night. And I'm going to have to keep going at least for the next day. But that night, it's freezing cold. Conditions weren't great. It wasn't a storm, but it was a gale. I had 30 knots of wind, seas breaking over the boat on a regular basis. Uh, most of all, it was cold. I mean, it was super cold. Uh, without moaning, I did get frostbite at the ends of my fingertips <laughs> that night. But that night, I saw the two lights of Cape Horn. The Cape Horn Islands got two lighthouses on it. And it's just the most amazing sight as a sailor because you're on the helm, you're done in, and suddenly these two little blinks, these two flashing lights come out, and I've made my landfall. I've found my Cape Horn. A massive boost. Dawn comes, guess what? I'm still sailing. <laughs> no, nobody had come to relieve me on the wheel. Dawn comes up, and I can see the whole archipelago ahead of me. I can see Cape Horn, I can see the islands around it. Just an amazing sight. Uh, and it just gave me a real lift. And I really was on my last legs, but it gave me a real lift at that time. And I thought, well, if nothing else happens, if I don't do anything else, I've sailed 20,000 miles alone and I've rounded Cape Horn. I'm one of less than 300 people that was ever dumb enough to try and do that and pull that off. So it, it gave me a real boost. But I couldn't stop in the night of scenery because I've got to go and repair puffing because I can't get home unless I'm going to fix this boat. And this is where the universe starts to kick in again for me because what I really need is a pit stop. And I was, I was lucky. Again, the universe has stepped in and helped me a few, a few times now. So the sailing network were talking to each other, unknown to me. My team manager had spoken to a friend, had spoken to a friend. And before we knew it, they'd come up with Mark and Carolyn, the sailing vessel, Jonathan, who just so happened to be at anchor behind Cape Horn, would you believe? <laughs> but they're a very special couple. They take people on the holidays to the Antarctica. So they're, they're, they're serious sailors. Anyway, they've been watching my race. They've been watching Puffin on the tracker. They knew we had a problem. And they got together and said, yeah, if Ian can get to this anchorage, we can help him out. So I got the call, make your way to Picton Island, and certainly best with Jonathan can help you out. And that's exactly what they did. I worked my way through the islands uh, behind Cape Horn. Mark sailed his boat out, met me, led me in. 
and we dropped, we dropped an anchor. And over the next four days, I, with Mark and Carolyn's help, repaired Puffin at anchor. So I never really went to shore. I didn't have to go to a port. Uh, and they fed me and they warmed me up and they gave me human company for the first time in 200 days. It was quite amazing. And I'm, I know this is not a great picture, but I'm waving goodbye in the snow. So this is the end of the summer, buddy. This is Cape Horn summer, right? <laughs> this is, this is how, we get, how we get. So I'm waving goodbye in the snow. And I thought, this is the absolute peak of my adventure. This is it. It's just wonderful. I wouldn't have had it any other way. What a fantastic experience. I, you know, I'm home with Ben now, right? So it's, uh, it's all downhill from here. It can't get any harder from there, right? It's all downhill from here. So I left Picton, which is the name of the island, about day 205. And I expected to have um, about 50 days ahead of me to get home to France. And we were doing well. We had a great start. We sailed northeast up past the Falkland Islands, heading up into the South Atlantic. Um, I'm still 46 degrees south at this point, so not, no complacency. I've got to get above 40 to really start to get into nicer weather. So although things were going well, I wasn't complacent. And <laughs> it proved to be the case because by, on the 9th of April, I got the first phone call from race control. It's very rare to get a call from race control. It's only if there's some serious weather coming. And basically, we had a first weather warning that a storm was brewing. And uh, this low, fast-moving, low-pressure system was coming my way. Uh, and you know, they were basically giving me a heads up and a warning that this was, this was, this was heading towards me. And then we have a storm. No such thing as a perfect storm, guys. Doesn't matter what it says in the movies. They're all horrible. This one was going to be really horrible. So I got two things. I got a weather warning that this thing was, was forming. It was heading my way. And then I got a routing, which is, again, very rare. It's the first time in the race. But what a routing is, is they tell you where to go. And they said, sail south as fast as you can. So I bravely sailed south as fast as I could to get away from this. Remember, I'm trying to go north, so south is 180 degrees away from where I want to be. So for 12 hours, I, I sailed south. Unfortunately, nobody told the depression, the low pressure system, because it decided also to change direction and, and, and come down towards me. And unfortunately, this routing had me heading towards what we commonly describe as the eye of the storm. Not great. So what happens, quick met lesson, when these low pressure systems come rolling across the Southern Ocean is that uh, normally the wind's coming from the Northwest and you get this sudden shift to the West and the Southwest as the pressure system rolls, as the storm rolls over you. And what that does is it creates a really nasty, confused sea state. So if you imagine all the winds coming from one direction, all the waves are coming from one direction. When that wind shifts, you get a second set of waves, a second swell, as you do in some beaches and you, you get this nasty two swells meet each other you get what we call confused seas. Big euphemism. <laughs> confused is not the right term for this at all. Now, that's normally not a problem. This wasn't our first rodeo, right? We've been at sea for, what, 200 days or whatever by now. We've seen plenty of gales and storms. The issue is if you're too close to the center of that system, that switch happens very quickly. Those seas become very nasty. So we progressed south during that day. And, you know, the, the weather got bad. It went from, you know, poor to bad to, to, to pretty terrible. And then the system passed over us. And it was like something flicked a switch. Suddenly, the weather went from awful to biblical. And I mean Old Testament biblical here. Yeah. It's proper white out. You know, you don't want to be there conditions. And the long and the short of it is that Puffin and I were really struggling. So the, the Celsius system couldn't cope with the combination of the sea and, and the weight of the wind. You know, these winds are gusting, this is 88 knots, and that's about 100 miles an hour, right? So you, you can all picture what that's like. If you climbed out of your car 100 miles an hour and tried to sit on the roof and steer over a plowed field with hailstones, you know, that's kind of what's going on. And I make light of it, but that gives you a feel for what's going on here. And we really, you know, the boat was struggling. I was in trouble. I knew we were in trouble. And then my world changed in a heartbeat, literally in, in a heartbeat. Puffin was hit by a breaking wave on the beam on her side. And you can hear it coming, it's like a train. And the, the, the impact uh, of these waves, it's like being T-boned in a car, it's analogous to a car accident. So suddenly I get T-boned by this wave. The boat capsizes. Uh, I believe she rolled 360 degrees. 
I say that because I was knocked, must have been knocked out for a couple of seconds, not for long, but long enough that when I came to, I'm sitting on my chart table, I've got blood pouring all over me, my shoulder's gone, the, got two feet of water in the boat, place is in chaos. Not good. Not, not, a, good, <laughs> not a good day in the office for certain. And uh, yeah, everything had changed. Everything had changed. I'm inside my boat's chaos, but I need to look at what's going on outside. I kind of instinctively knew what was likely to be out there, but I had to go out and check what the damage was. And I went, came out of my companion way, and the mast had gone. My mast had gone. It was actually hanging like a sort of broken wing over the side of the boat. And guys, it's like a feeling of loss, this immediate feeling of loss. Uh, and it's a strange way of describing it, but it's really, you know, just sinking feeling, excuse the pun, <laughs> um, of loss to see this happen because, you know, that's game over for my race, but it also meant that, you know, it could be a lot worse. This was just the beginning of something else. And, you know, when I, when I kind of try to think of how I describe it to people, things could get worse, but, you know, when you look at something, you think, I can't press pause, I can't rewind, I can't reboot and play again. This is very real and it's done, it's done. So I bravely retreated down below to, to have a think about this, to decide what I was gonna, what I was gonna have to do next. And really what that was, was to move into survival mode. I needed to now snake puff in and turn her into a life raft, essentially. Uh, and there's a few things that had to be done there to do that. So I now I've triggered my EPIRB. So I've sent my Mayday out. I've taken my, this is a tracking device called the Yellow Brick. I can send satellite messages, short messages by over satellite with this. It's also got an emergency button. So I press this as well. So I've done an EPIRB and I've done this. I've done both because if you fire one flare, it could be an accident. If you put two flares up, that's not a problem, right? So I've done the same electronically here. So I've set that off. That's all I can do with this at the moment. So now I need to stabilize my boat. So there's a two or three things you've got to do. First thing, water. Get the water out and keep it out. I've got about two feet of water at the cabins in chaos. Water's kind of up, up, up to here. I've got a broken hatch where I've got water coming back in, so I cut away some, some, some uh, wreckage. I close this hatch down. I then turn my bilge pumps off, which I know is counterintuitive, but I needed to know if there was more water coming in this boat. So I basically go around best I can. I expect for looking for breaks, for breaches in the boat. Couldn't find anything. So I'm now hand pumping, pumping out this bilge water. And really all I'm trying to do is work out is there more water coming in the boat. I get to a point and I satisfy myself, oh, we're good, right? We're, so we're, we're not taking on any more water. So I stop and I leave the chaos. My next concern is I've been rolled once. So you can imagine how vulnerable that boat is now. Because guess what? Nobody told the storm that I was having a hard time. It's still blowing like hell outside. Nothing had changed. Just because I was having a bad day, it didn't care. And it wasn't trying to get me, it was just doing its thing, right? I was just, I was just in the way. So I was really concerned about being rolled again. And there's the drogue that I mentioned earlier, the handbrake, was going to be useful in this case as well, but it meant going back outside into the storm and preparing this thing. And this thing comes in a bag, it's a bit like a family tent, I don't know, 15 kilos, what's that, 20 pounds, 30 pounds? US money, I don't know. It's a big bag. Big bags out of the lock, and then there's a big bag of chain about another 30 kilos. I've got to shackle the two things together. I couldn't put the bridle on. I've got to launch it off the back of the boat. All the time, this wind gusts are blowing 80, 90 miles an hour. It's all, everything you touch is trying to blow itself away. We launch the drogue. What that does, it brings puffing around to the main swell. The sea state's coming from behind her, and that helps to stabilize and protect us. So great, two things. Third thing now, I've got this mast, it's broken, it's hanging on the side of the boat, and it's slamming, slamming, slamming against the boat. Obviously, my big concern is that's gonna reach the boat, break, break my hull, that's gonna sink me, right? So I've gotta try and work on this. To do that, I've gotta cut away all the wire rigging that's holding this in place. Can you imagine these stainless steel wires to hold a mast up? Um, in a workshop, they're difficult to cut. So on a day like today, it's not gonna be easy, but I try, I cut the first few away, and I just get hit time and time again by these breaking waves of the boat, and essentially it's just too much. So I decided to leave that for the moment because finally, now my brain is catching up with all my actions, I'm realizing that I can't become a casualty here. Right? I'm already a little bit bashed a bit, but if I become more of a casualty, then I've got a massive problem. I've got to be able to be part of my own rescue. So I retreat bravely down below, close the hatch, 
<laughs> and um, you kind of, if you like, think about what to do next. Catch up with myself here. Okay. <laughs> so, time moves on. Um, <laughs> so, I've jumped ahead once. So, I've gone down below and I've um, spoken to race control by this time. In fact, I've taken a message through on this fellow who comes in. And the message says to me, boat's been identified, ship's identified, 120 nautical miles away. Fantastic news. Good news, right? Really good. Okay, so that's good. That's only 10 hours. It's getting dark now. I can't go back outside to try and cut this rig out. I'm going to wait till first light. So I decided to get some rest. It's all going dark. Boat's still got plenty of water. <laughs> I've got this message here. Okay. I've had better days, but, you know, we're, we're okay. We're going to strap ourselves into the bunk for a few hours. And you kind of look around at this point, and I realize like, all my hopes and dreams are kind of disintegrating around me here tonight. Not great. Then this thing goes off again. Second message. Uh, boat is not responding. Nobody's coming. <laughs> okay, great. Okay. So I'd had better days, and this was, this was my, you know, as I said on the last slide, my long, long dark night of the soul. But I always expected it to take a long time. I'm 46 degrees south. This was not going to be easy. So I sort of tell myself, well, that's okay. That's, this is all part, the, all part of the, you know, the, the journey and such. Get yourself together. Dawn comes, I'm up, I'm pumping water out of the boat again, I've gone back out on deck, I've tried to cut some more rigging away, and we, uh, we get a new message again on this yellow brick. I came to love this thing, I hate it, because every time it gave, it took away as well, like the next message. So the next message comes through, and it says, Fisheries UK flagged fisheries patrol vessel is steaming, uh, called Lilibet, it's on its way to you, 30 hours away. Result, this is the best possible result. This is a professional crew. Think Coast Guard. These guys are going to launch a boat. They're going to come alongside. I'm going to be able to talk to the skipper. They might even be able to salvage Puff and take me to the Falklands. I'm almost booking flights at this point. I thought this is, we're, we're in a good state. And it's a British boat, you know? Whoa. Uh, couldn't be better. Couldn't be better. So I carry on prepare, preparing Puff on this expectation. Guess what? This damn thing goes off again. Uh, Lily Bet's been stood down. She's not coming. But, but, but there's a Taiwanese fishing boat that's closer and it's on its way called the Z Da Wang. Okay, not so good as a fishery patrol boat, but that was 30 hours away. 30 hours, that was another day and another night. I was okay with that. But again, not the, not the nicest place to be for another day and another night. Z Da Wang is only eight hours away. Okay, so not so, not quite what I wanted, but still only eight hours away. That's fantastic news. Everything's changed. This is now a fishing boat that's coming in for me. Right? They don't do this for a day job. So this is all about what the weather conditions are going to be like and the skill of the crew as, 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 they, as they approach. It's not the same as the Coast Guard coming for you at all. Really, everything was changing at that point. I called my race control on the sat phone. I've got my backup sat phone there. The first one was destroyed. Backup sat phone uh, working. I called to confirm this message. Have I understood it? Yes. Zidar Wang's coming. Eight hours away, fantastic. And race control say, can you climb a ladder? I think, well, can, you close to me? can I climb? I've got a ladder, what are you talking about? Can I climb a ladder? And of course, what it meant was, up the rest, into the rescue ship, you know, can you climb a ladder? How is your back? So I'd injured my back. And I thought about it for a second, I thought, yeah, I'll climb the ladder, trust me, don't worry. <laughs> if I have to, I'll climb the ladder, not a problem. So, I carried on preparing the boat. I'll, uh, I'll speed forward a little bit here, okay? <laughs> okay. I carried on getting ready for the Zida Wang to turn up. And um, some hours passed, and then I heard on the VHF, I heard actually uh, Mandarin spoken on, on, on the VHF, so I knew this fishing boat was nearby. I couldn't see her, I couldn't see her anywhere. So I put loads of calls in Zida Wang, Zida Wang, this is puffing, this is puffing. No, nothing, no answers, no answers, I'm thinking, oh, God. I'm sure these guys are going to find me, right? They've got all my coordinates. It should be kept going back up. Couldn't see this boat coming in. And all the time to keep busy, I'm still pumping water. I'm, cut, I'm, still, I'm still cutting away my rig. Um, they've got the mast away from the hull now. It's still attached to the boat, but it wasn't slamming anymore. Big result. And I think, well, I'll just, keep, I'll just keep, keep doing this. Things are calming down. Maybe it was a gale at this stage in terms of weather. 
um, and I want to cut away my four stays. It's not wondering what they are, they're just wires on the front of the boat. I want to get these cut and get them clear of the boat. So I'm lying spread eagle on the deck, literally on my belly, with an angle grinder in one hand, hanging on with the other hand, trying to cut wires away. And the boat gets engulfed with this wave and it just picks me up. And I'm kind of here and it just picks me up and it throws me off the end of the boat. And this is a pull at the pointy end of the boat. Thank God I'd clipped on. I spun around, my torso was still here, my legs were hanging over the edge of the boat. And I'm thinking, you are an idiot. What the hell are you doing? This is, there's a ship coming to save you, and I'm literally getting myself killed, cutting away, cutting away the rigging. So I got my angle going there, because it cost me a lot of money. We covered that, got that thing. <laughs> and I bravely retreat back down, down below, and decided to leave that. Don't become a casualty. Back to the seriousness. In all seriousness, don't become a casualty because these guys, are, they're not going to be able to get to you. If I'm incapacitated, they're really going to struggle to get to me. So I bravely retreated back. Again, see that wang, see that wang. Can't, can't hear them. And then I get one message over the VHF and it says, Puffin, we're coming for you. In quite broken English. I go, oh, that sounds good. <laughs> Where are you? No answer. And then, you know, I look up, I go outside uh, after bravely hiding down below for a while and recovering from being washed off the front of the boat. And 250 feet of steel turns up in the shape of this Taiwanese fishing boat, the Zidao Wang. Boom. Out of nowhere. I don't know where the hell it came from? It's just like, boom, it was there. Amazing. Big relief, as you can imagine. And then, really, what happened from there happened very, very quickly. My big challenge was there was no communication with Zhu Dao Wang. I couldn't speak to the bridge and they couldn't speak to me. Uh, so I had no idea what their plan was uh, or what they wanted from me as part of the rescue. But what was happening is the skipper was bringing the Zhu Dao Wang beam on that's sideways on. Imagine Putin sitting like this. The Zhu Dao Wang is like this. And what the skipper was doing was making a lee. He's flattening the ocean because the waves and the wind were coming from this direction. So he's flattening the ocean. And he was bringing his boat down, his vessel down, onto, onto Puffin like this, like a T-shape. Uh -huh. And essentially, all it was, what that was, he was doing an amazing job, really still, very, very difficult to move and maneuver a great big 250-foot fishing boat down towards a small sailing boat. And he did an amazing job. Uh, but really, what it was was a controlled crash. He was basically going to crash his boat into my boat. That was the plan. That was the plan. And as they got closer, I'm looking up and on the rail, there's 50 faces, the whole crew were out there, all had their, their life jackets on, their protective gear, and there's 50 guys looking at me with really worried expressions on their faces. <laughs> and I'm looking at them thinking, oh right, so I guess I'm looking worried too. And this boat's coming down, and there's no ladder. Where's the effing ladder, right? What, 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 what do they want from me? No communication. So I'm, I'm looking at the crew on the rail and I eyeball one guy who's given instructions and I think that must be the bosun. So I make contact, eyeball to eyeball contact with this guy and that's how we communicate. And he looked at me, he nodded and he heaved a line, missed. <laughs> heaved a second line, missed. <laughs> and he heaved a third line, got it on the deck. I secured the bow of the boat, this. he's nodding at me, that was the right thing. I go to the stern of the boat here, boom, and then we make contact. And it's just like, oh, it's a gut-wrenching feeling. I mean, imagine buying a new car. You go into the car park, and he opens the door, starts smashing the door against the new car. It's exactly that feeling. It's oh, awful, awful. But of course, he can sink me at any point as well, right? So it's pretty serious. So I'm waving for a second line. I need a second line to, to secure my stern because the boat's pulling away from, from, from the fishing boat. It's slamming together. It pulls away, and it slams together. And the crew are all shouting, slow down, slow down. No. Go slow, that's what they said. Go slow. I don't know how fast I was going, but go slow. They get me a second line, I secure the second line. Still no ladder. And I'm looking up at these guys like this, and the boat's surging back with the floors, and finally a rope ladder comes down the side of the boat. Awesome. Then my boat, nothing, surges away from the rope ladder. <laughs> this is never going to end. I get out midships, the boats line up, I wait for the roll, I jump from the ladder, I'm on the ladder. I take two steps. And the crew were leaning over the side on their gear, and they just grabbed me, like anything they could grab hold of, pulled me over. And as they pulled me up, Huffin and the fishing boat, boom, came together, kind of where I was a second ago. So it was all a bit close, but there you go. 
rescued. I was on the deck of the Zedar Wang, surrounded by the guys, putting their arms around me, patting me on the back. Absolutely wonderful. That all took no more than 30 minutes from start to finish. It happened very, very quickly, and there wasn't a lot of time for going back and reviewing and having a bit of a discussion. Uh, no time for a scrum, just had to do it, <laughs> get, get, get up there. Uh, but amazing, there I was, I was on the deck, and I was safe. Then possibly the worst moment of the whole voyage happened. So this boatswain, the guy that's in charge of the deck, uh, he didn't have any English, I didn't have any Mandarin, and he just looked at me, and he looked at the fin, and I knew what he meant, I knew what he was saying. Puffy was slamming against the side of the boat. Yes. I just nodded at him, and he gave the instruction, they cut the lines, and they, they let her go. Let my friend go. Four years of my life, was in that boat. She'd kept me safe, and the worst things that happened, you now I was letting her go. It felt just awful. I'm being good to them, saying, I'm all right today. <laughs> it's okay. And she was gone. It was puffing. But I didn't have much time to dwell on it, really. They uh, whipped me down below and surrounded me with love. It was such an amazing crew. They were fantastic. Within half an hour, I'd had a hot shower. Salt water, of course, but it was hot. Hot shower. Uh, the boat had stripped me off, which I thought was strange, but there you go. He stripped me off and he patched me up, patched up my shoulders, patched up my head. They'd given me a set of clothes, exactly the same uniform as if when you go to prison, exactly the same set of gear, actually. <laughs> and they took me up in a bunk uh, with Davy Jones. Now, does anybody, has anybody heard of Davy Jones's locker? Do I need to explain that? You've got, you got Davy Jones's locker. It's a mythical place at the bottom of the sea where sailors, when they drown, that's where they go. They go to Davy Jones's locker, and you spend all eternity in there. Pirates of the Caribbean explains it all. Just, <laughs> just go, go back to that, explains it all. So, the one guy on the boat that's got really good English, a Filipino guy, and his name was Davy Jones Beltran. And he said, don't worry, you're in with Davy Jones. And I think, <laughs> you've just literally pulled me out of the ocean, and you're going to put me in David Jones' locker. I kid you not, you can't make this stuff up. Nobody else saw the irony. Nobody else saw the irony. And it took me 10 days to explain the David Jones story to these guys. Uh, so yeah, I was put into David Jones's locker. The crew were amazing. Just to, hard lives, big hearts, right? There was, they just looked after me for that whole journey. And a few takeaways. Being on the, so I was on the Zedar Wang for 10 days. So I've only been back, well, no, six weeks since the incident. 10 of those, 10 days of the six weeks was on the fishing boat. But it was like pressing pause emotionally. It was quite amazing because I was great. I was on great form on that boat. There's very limited English spoke, spoken, and we, there was no need to explain. The guys, we were just, we just laughed, we joked, we had food, we loved to post photographs of each of his families. There was never any need for any explanation. And it was just like pressing pause. It was quite an amazing thing. And I got, I got 56 friends for life. My, my uh, Instagram account now is full of guys who are in Taiwan at the moment, Filipino guys, Indonesian guys, guys from Vietnam, and of course guys from Taiwan. Wonderful. Just absolutely wonderful. And uh, I'm not signing up for another voyage. I wouldn't wreck, you know, if Disney, Taiwanese fishing boat, you know, don't know. Stick to the Caribbean cruises, I think. But there you go, 10 days, and we were, uh, we were in, coming into, into Cape, Cape Town. And my first steps ashore was me on the bridge with the guys. Amazing. So I get to Cape Town, and my Golden Globe family are waiting to pick me up. So like everywhere I went around the world, somebody else basically looked after me is what was happening. <laughs> More people I've never met before. Took me off the boat, signed me in through immigration, got me through immigration, took me home, fed me, took me to the, took, took me to the doctors, got me checked out. It's amazing. The kindness of strangers in my story is like overwhelming elements of, of, of the whole experience. Forget the feeling. It was just quite incredible. But Cape Town, what was struck me about my time there was not the fact that I'd been at sea for whatever that was, 220 days at that point. I was stepping ashore, which is kind of a bit weird, uh, having a few great meals, a lot of barbecues, a lot of red wine, which was all, all good, getting back into normality, checked out by the doctor, all, all very good. But all of a sudden I was telling the story and I was expected to tell the story. And then this loss just got me and it just floored me. 
and I was exhausted. I spent 10 days on the fishing boat. I was ready to be part of the crew. I was ready for the next trip to Japan. It wasn't, I was, I was good. I got off and it obviously it just sort of hit me. The BBC want to have a phone call, got in press. So, you know, by the time you told the story five times, emotionally, you are absolutely exhausted. And I just couldn't get over what had happened and what, what I'd lost. I felt like I'd lost everything, in a sense. It was really quite a hard period. But it's all okay, because I'm going home, right? I'm safe, I'm in one piece, I'm going home. I've just got one more stop before I go home. It just so happened that the timing, not a terrible picture when it scaled up, just so happened that the timing was, as I was ready to leave Cape Town three or four days later, the first skippers were arriving back at the end of the race. We we're going to cross the line in France. Yeah, same timing, um, which is kind of amazing. And I, it just struck me that I needed to go to France. I couldn't go home yet. I needed to go to France. Excuse me. And complete my odyssey, if that makes sense. I don't. I can't quite explain it, but it was a way of completing the journey. So whatever it was, 219 days at sea, the storm, I've lost nothing, 10 days on the fishing boat, three days in Cape Town, I fly to Paris, jump on a train, get to Le Sable alone, get off the train, get in the car, go to the port, literally left my bags in the car, stepped on a rip, and straight out on the water, I met Kirsten here as she crossed the line, first skip of that. So it was just, it was an amazing time, but it was a sort of priceless experience. And I was clearly the last person in the world she was expecting to see. But, <laughs> uh, and then two days later, I was doing the same with my good friend, Abelesh, uh, Tommy here, who came in second, who, uh, who I'm particularly close to. And that was wonderful. And that was just, you know, it was, it's hard to explain it, really. It was, it, was a, it was a journey in its own right. Yeah. I was still wearing my prison clothes from, from the fishing boat. I didn't have, I literally had one set of gear. I didn't have any gear yet. I was borrowing clothes off it. And everyone I met said, do you need that jacket? Um, but I wasn't home yet. I wasn't home yet. Um, I wasn't home yet. Now, seeing the skippers complete their journey, that was priceless. No two ways about it. Um, and I just had one more step to go home. One of the teams invited me for a lunch. I was having yet another steak. This is day two. Beautiful restaurant overlooking the water. And I'm literally there. I've got an iPhone now, right? I've been technology-less for a long time. So I'm just getting used to having my device back. I'm, I'm looking at flights. And I look up, and Sally, my wife, and Emma walk into the restaurant. Totally out of the blue. Utterly blew me away, guys. Apart from everyone else in France knew it was going to happen, except for me. <laughs> so they were planning it from Cape Town. Because I called Sally. Of course I'd call my wife. I said, look, I've got to go to France. She said, yeah, of course you have. You've got to go to France. That's okay. We don't need you. You carry on. <laughs> and they just walked into the restaurant, a bit like Owen on the rib, when it's so unexpected, so unexpected. They even had the documentary team with the flaming cameras behind them. I was just amazing. So, so I hadn't got home. The home came to me. And that sort of really completed my circle, I suppose. You know, back to family. So to finish... I could have done the other two. No, I'm not finished. I've got another slide here. <laughs> I'm, not trying to, I'm not trying to draw any lessons. I'm not trying to teach anybody anything at this stage. But to explain how I feel, six weeks later, I would have never have wished for my adventure, my dream, to, ended, to have ended this way, to have lost Puffin, to have you know, nearly lost everything. But now that it's happened, I've embraced it. I've completely owned it. And honestly, I can say today, I would not have had it any other way. This is the way it was supposed to be. This was my, you know, my, my race, my adventure, my odyssey, right? And this is the way it played out. So this is now my story. And I'm very happy to share it with you today. <laughs> Thank you.